Hey, I'm Sarah, and welcome to the Your Health Matters podcast. Today, we are talking with Dr. Sastry from SUMA, and it's so great to have you today, doctor. We're talking about pancreatic cancer today. So first of all, tell us a little bit of, about what you do in your role in helping so many people that have been impacted by pancreatic cancer. Well, first, thank you very much for having me on. Um, uh, my role here at SUMA is as a hepatopancreatic biliary specialist. So uh, one of the parts of what I deal with is in all parts of pancreatic disease is specifically with pancreatic cancer. And that stems from the diagnosis, the workup, to the staging, to even the treatment, which is ultimately what I do as a surgeon is surgery for pancreatic cancer. So tell us, because I, I don't honestly really know, and I assume maybe other people don't either, what is the role of the pancreas in our body? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of people aren't really familiar. They've just heard of it. Um, basically, you can think of it as um, a medium-sized organ, you could say, situated in the back of your body, uh, behind your stomach. It's almost shaped like a gun, like a little handgun. And uh, it serves two main uh um, focuses. Number one being uh, its exocrine function, which is to help digest certain elements of food, whether that's sugars and fats. And number two is endocrine function, which many people are familiar with, is uh, with the regulation of glucose. So people who have a malfunctioning uh, pancreas at times could have diabetes. And that's something that everyone is familiar with. And uh, the pancreas does secrete other types of hormones, but those are the main functions. Okay, so you mentioned diabetes there because I think I, I read recently that uh, diabetes played a role in, in someone's pancreatic cancer and sometimes even as someone ages, if they get diagnosed with maybe type 1 diabetes as they age, it could be a sign of pa pancreatic cancer. So is, is there roles in that? Slightly. There's no direct link between having diabetes and forming pancreatic cancer, but they are interconnected. If you or if a patient were to have diabetes and let's just say they developed a cancer, it might manifest as uh, increased blood sugars. Or if they were to get surgery and they have a history of diabetes, their diabetes might worsen because they're all interconnected. Whether you remove a portion of the pancreas or that portion isn't working, it does affect affect the overall function of the pancreas. But no, it does not actually cause pancreatic cancer. Okay. And how common is pancreatic cancer? Because I, I feel like I've always heard it's it's more rare than other types of cancers. But yet I do feel like I've known people who have been impacted, not a lot, but enough that it just makes me wonder how common is it? That's also a great question. It accounts for about 3% of all cancers. It's about the eighth to 10th most common cancer amongst all of them. And you're right, it is fairly rare, but it is increasing in incidence and it does occur frequent enough that we see it and we're constantly trying to treat it and detect it as early as possible. Now, going a little further about how common is it, I've also heard that it impacts men more than women. Is that true? Uh, statistically speaking, that is true. We do note that in the um, statistics, but generally speaking, I think it's fairly equivalent in terms of the patients that we see on a regular basis. And what are some of the signs and symptoms of pancreatic cancer? Well, it depends on the location of the, of the tumor itself. Cancers that are on the head of the pancreas, which is on the patient's right side, tend to present as what we call obstructive jaundice, where the patient has yellowing of the skin, yellowing of their eyes, and darker urine, and they may or may not have pain. If the cancer were to be on the other side, on the left side, they may not have any symptoms, but they may, ha may have significant amount of weight loss, you know, maybe 50 pounds in a few months' time, loss of appetite, and generally just not feeling well, and is what we call wasting away. And some of the signs that we look for when we're examining a patient, again, is signs of aggressive weight loss, yellowing of the skin. Sometimes we can palpate lymph nodes as well on the exam. 
What about risk factors that people should be aware of? The most common risk factors include smoking and chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis typically occurs in patients who have a longstanding uh, alcohol abuse history, but it can occur from a lot of other things, including uh, having a long-term history of gallstones and from a variety of other causes, which include hypercalcemia and uh, hypertriglyceridemia, but those are a little more, more rare. And lastly, yeah. of course, is a family history. Mm. That's why I was going to ask that if there is a family history, if anything, I mean, it's genetic. And if it's genetic, are there things that make maybe you can look for in advance? That's also a great question. Uh, there's definitely a genetic component in some patients. There are some genomic uh, mutations and germline mutations that are associated with it, such as the BRCA2 um, um, mutations. However, mostly speaking, these are sporadic mutations that occur from generally inflammation. And obviously, as we know, smoking and pancreatitis both associate with inflammation and injury of the pancreas. Um, what are things we can do to pick them up early? I, I noted that you mentioned that. And one of the things that we try to do is whenever we see anything on the pancreas in any type of imaging, we try to assess the nature of it, how big is it, and some of the factors that might tell us this looks suspicious. As in comparison to other types of cancers uh, where we can easily palpate them or do, for instance, a colonoscopy, pancreas is a little different. We can't necessarily do CAT scans every year for everybody. We have to look for other uh, features in order to detect it. And... I have to say, I've not heard of a lot of people being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at younger ages, 20s, 30s. Is it something that impacts you as you get older more so? Yes, uh, that would be true. Uh, it's exceedingly rare in younger patients. Uh, generally speaking, you might first start to hear about it typically in the 60s and onward. Um, and then again, it's generally because of a, a, a long-standing history of inflammation that builds up and eventually results in uh, tumor formation. So the big question, what are some treatment options a physician like yourself may use to treat pancreatic cancer? So one of the first things is establishing a diagnosis. And sometimes establishing a diagnosis can be difficult and a biopsy is not sufficient and we have to do surgery just to establish that. And sometimes that surgery is, is both diagnostic and therapeutic. But generally speaking, the treatment modalities include surgery, which would be either to remove the right half of the pancreas, we call that a Whipple procedure, or the left half, we call that a distal pancreatectomy. These procedures can be done with the small incisions, the robotic approach. Um, so those are the mainstays uh, for cancer treatment of the pancreas with surgery. However, one of the biggest advances in pancreas cancer has been the chemotherapy. In the past 20 to 30 years, uh, the chemotherapy has gotten a lot better and the five-year survival has also improved significantly. Um, in the 80s and 90s, People were quoted a uh, five-year survival in 20% or less. Nowadays, with really good chemotherapy, some patients who respond well to the chemotherapy have a five-year survival of up to 40%. So that's promising news. It's very promising news and exciting to hear. And I know SUMA, you guys are always doing so much and advancements and care for patients. Tell me a little more about what SUMA specifically is doing in the area of pancreatic cancer. Well, what we pride ourselves on is, is uh, getting to know the patients and getting them in our system so that we can establish personalized care. That's first and foremost. Secondly, we discuss all our cases at our tumor board. So basically, all of our cancer doctors are talking and we're in communication with one another to get the best care for the patient. Once we discuss the case uh, thoroughly with our radiologist, with our pathologist, to make sure we're absolutely certain, we determine the best way of approaching the treatment, whether that be by chemotherapy or surgery or both, and even sometimes radiation as well. Well, it sounds like there's so many good advancements. I love to hear that the survival rate from 10 
20 years ago has increased and more advancements. It's all great and patient care, so important. So thank you so much for joining us today and talking more about the risk factors and what we need to know um, for ourselves or for loved ones. Um, it really does make an impact. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you very much. We're very happy to take care of anyone who comes uh, to our offices and uh, um, more than welcome to see anyone here. Well, thank you. So if you would like to know more, you can go right to SUMA's website and uh, learn more about their care services. It's sumahealth.org slash cancer to find out more.